So, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, if you know by now, I'm Fahim and I will be leading today's discussion session. And the contents of my discussion will be centered on advancements in data input methods, particularly for large target objects, and also for sort of uh, the next step in gesture recognition. These are the contents of my presentation. So first, I will show you guys some videos about mapping using drones and robots. Basically, uh, they send a target signal and then they receive it back to scan an object. And we can use that sort of data for CAD purposes. So this is an, oh, sorry, an aerial drone which uses uh, LiDAR laser mapping. Flight test crew here at the Drones Data X conference in San Francisco, and I'm here with Cameron Gia from Velodyne. How you doing, Cameron? I'm doing great. Manufacturer of lidar. Lidar in this application is a spinning array of 16 different lasers, all inside this little thing which we call the puck. Each laser is emitting light, and we're monitoring the time it takes for the light to get back to the sensor, and then producing an image, basically of a 3D rendering of the space that we're standing in. What we're seeing on the screen here is a display of what the sensor is seeing. So in real time, we're basically capturing 16 channels of 3D data of the facility. So if I move it up and down, you can actually see as, it, as the light moves up and down. And this is a proper rendering of the physical space we're inside of. So it's like radar, except using a laser instead. Absolutely. What do people use this technology for? So today, the biggest driving market for LiDAR is autonomous driving and navigation. So within a couple of years, see this technology on every automobile on the road in autonomous driving mode. So that's the big, giant market. But of course, we're here at, at DroneX today. And in the drone market, you can use this for gathering data as opposed to navigation. So we have customers doing things like mapping. We have customers doing forestry. And in the forestry world, there's a really interesting feature this has called dual returns. OK, so uh, I think uh, Professor and Abby are very familiar with the LiDAR technology in used for mapping, uh, especially for autonomous robot vehicles. So uh, each of them. OK. And Similar uh, technology is also used for underwater probes. Most sonar systems are up on the surface on a ship or a submarine, and some are there dropped is. by air. There this is. is the first system that operates down deep at the bottom of the ocean. sound out in the water, which reflects off of objects in the water, and it looks up to a very large field of view of approximately 30 nautical miles across, kind of like the way satellites look down, we are looking up where cellulite. So the main reason for uh, deploying these would be a defense, uh, where it searches the ocean above it, um, and then says, okay, so it's safe to come and bring another ship through here. Or it could be a, a barrier that if a submarine came through, it would detect that submarine and then provide tracking information as to where the submarine is going. It's unique in its capabilities that it's a fully autonomous, that the, the device drives around and figures out how to search the area without an operator uh, running it. It has a communication link that it's able to exfiltrate its data via an acoustic link to the surface, and then there's a persistent buoy that then transmits that information by a satellite. Okay, and uh, this sort of technology was actually used to search for the missing Malaysian airline plane by sending sonar. So the difference between the first video I showed you is that that used laser, and this one uses sonar for underwater purposes. And this is using an underwater probe to 
make a map of the seabed. As you can see, it's very pretty accurate. And lastly, uh, uh, similar technology has also been used for mapping. Uh, For first discussion, uh, we saw uh, in Alex's discussion that people use MRI and laser for small objects and they do it manually. So how do you guys think this sort of autonomous large scale mapping would be used for CAD applications? Do you think uh, it would be useful or? So it's obtaining data, that means Maybe for reverse engineering stuff of large objects? Yeah, uh, I was thinking that uh, if it were to scan, for example, a large terrain or, uh, for example, a power plant, it would be able to get the data, but it would not be very useful for inside parts. You know what I mean? Because the it's collecting data by reflection of a signal. So it can only get sort of a surface model and not exactly inner parts, right? But uh, do you think this has any advantages over, uh, for example, the laser scanning or MRI scanning which we saw before? Don't you think that it's also scanning unnecessary items? Uh, what do you mean? Unnecessary, like additional or more because it's on a larger scale. Yeah. The, the laser or MRI was mm -hmm. hand controlled and... Yeah, so uh, I guess majority of CAD applications in industry is for smaller scale objects, right? And so scanning, for example, a uh, seabed or an entire city or something is not particularly useful for CAD applications, I believe. So uh, I thought of some pros and cons. And the pro is obviously that uh, it can deal with large area in uh, much less amount of time. And I think one advantage is that this is autonomous scanning, whereas the examples we saw were all mostly manual, right? And uh, the cons would obviously be that the use of drones and probes is quite expensive. And uh, there would be problems with reliability, I guess. Any other thoughts? Would you guys like to add some pros or cons? I think uh, it is, it uh, it appears to have less computational, uh, com less computation expensive as compared to rendering of point node or something like that. Because we was we were seeing the live feed in the video. Uh, very first in the drone video, yeah. we were seeing the live feed of the people. Yeah. Yeah. In here. So it appears to be less computation expensive, but at the same time, it is less accurate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a method to separate the part that we want yeah. from the I'll other surrounding parts. Yeah. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I thought about uh, how to take this to the next level. And instead of using signals and reflection to obtain data, I, I, I thought, why not directly from a photo, right? And th there is already a very good existing software by Autodesk, which is called Recap.
there is that, which is using a drone to take multiple pictures and then stitching them together to make a 3D model. Or there is uh, a more simpler... How's it going, printers? Andrew Singh from 3D Central here. And as desktop 3D printing has become faster, cheaper, and more reliable, 3D scanning technology has also started to pick up some steam as well. Recently, PhD student Aaron Jackson created a website that allows users to upload a 2D image and it can actually convert that into a 3D model. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I uploaded a picture of myself, got a 3D model out of it, printed it out, and also how to capture the color data so you can actually print a full color scan of your face. You ready? Let's dive right in. This program works by taking a 2D image, usually a, just an extreme close-up of a face that fills most of the frame, and it will actually find the face in that image and convert it into a 3D model. So what we're going to do is we're going to upload a 2D image and take a look at the 3D model and see what can we do with it from there. So first we're going to upload the image and hit compute. And that's going to take our 2D image and convert it into a... So the difference between this and the previous video is there is no uh, multiple images taken. They make the 3D model from a single image. So what do you guys think about this sort of uh, 3D models created directly from photos? Do you think, yeah? Uh, question, uh, how does the... The second method that works, like with the... Uh, actually, he, he made uh, this sort of face with that uh, software. It's actually a free software, so I don't think it's too reliable. But it's just in its infancy, so maybe uh, if there is more... Uh, for example, he did not use any stitching. He just used his 2D image and used that to make the 3D model. Perhaps if he used it from different angles and he stitched the images together, it would be making a more reliable 3D model. So do you guys think that this sort of uh, application would be useful in the cat industry, or? It would be useful, then how good? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, if you have to scan something, then you can, you have to need some scanner and make the three model. But if you can just click one picture and can make the There's some information theft, I guess. Yeah. Does it only work with good lighting? Uh, I'm not sure. The video does not really elaborate on that. I think they were just trying to advertise it, so they wouldn't show any bad sides. But yeah, so uh, obviously this would be, I think, quicker data acquisition than using laser or sonar scanning. And I guess this can also be uh, autonomous if we were to use a drone to capture pictures or something. And uh, it, th that software is actually free, the second video, so you can, I, I have the link in the references. It can be used by anyone actually, uh, as long as you have a 3D printing software as well. However, uh, the good stitching software such as the Autodesk Recap is actually a bit expensive. And uh, I think there might be some problems with uh, depth issues, I guess. Yes. Right? Uh, if there is a part that is hollow or something, then I don't think this would be uh, applicable for situations like that. And again, I think unless there is uh, some stitching involved, then just using a 2D picture may not be a very reliable form of creating the model. Right? But you said that linking this with drone. Mm -hmm. But in the video, uh, he said that we need more close-up close image? Uh, I think this, this video is actually 2015, and the Autodesk recap came out in 2016, I think. Okay. So maybe uh, since then, they have improved their uh, image to CAD model. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think the face thing is particularly pretty specialized for face. Face. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, makes so sense. you cannot apply it in general. But I think uh, for, uh, how do I say, on the run purposes, like if you need a, some quick solution or something, this sort of technology might be useful for uh, a really quick solution. So my third uh, discussion topic is about this AR sandbox, which is augmented reality. And I think uh, this is the next level in gest gesture recognition because it also involves propagation. And I will show you what I mean. So this is the AR sandbox developed by a UC Davis professor. So this is our 
our augmented reality sandbox. It was developed originally by researchers at UC Davis. We're going to be using it here at UCLA to help students learn about topography. So they can take a topographic map in the classroom, try to recreate the features uh, by manipulating the sand. I can you know, take one mound and make it into two mounds. I can then I can make it rain over the top of this, and I can see how the water flows down the sides of the hills, push that material up in here. That water wants to go somewhere else. Now it's going to float it through this channel into our reservoir below. So when the students are on the field, they don't have a sandbox to like recreate what they have on the map. Uh, they, they can recreate in their head. They can build a mental model and identify it where they're at, identifying certain features of the, in the area. And this is uh, one of the coolest scenes from yeah. Iron Man. So, uh, So we saw the Elon Musk video, right? Which was, I think, uh, made in 2014? 15. Yeah. Mark Billings The UC Davis sandbox thing was also uh, 2015. So I think if you could sort of combine, combine holographic technology with uh, gesture recognition and propagation, then it would be a very cool technology to use for uh, CAD uh, industry. So uh, what do you guys think? Like AR technology, I, I guess it will have the same problems as the gesture problem, right? Like use of hands and tiring of people. And we're more used to using mouses and stuff. But it's real time, like you have combined all the the real time data. I think it will be interesting to use that for analysis, for FEM, for fluid analysis, for heat transfer analysis. Actually, it's cool, but how productive it is? Yeah, that's one problem, I guess. Maybe for the in the case of the AR, we have our object, then we can move our hand to the object and create artificial stresses. Uh, yeah, I feel like uh, touching is very difficult to make this thing. So the, the video with the sandbox, I, it looks like he used real sand. Yeah. 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 Because of that feeling, it's not easy to make artificially. So force also is not easy to make. It, the feedback, feedback, force feedback, it's not easy. Yes, it's a problem. Go ahead. So I feel like this sort of technology would be good if there is a library of features or something and you want to assemble a part. But maybe for creating features or modifications, it is not so useful because uh, touch has to be very accurate. Right? So uh, as I said, I think the cons are very similar as for gesture recognition. And this technology is very young. So maybe with more advancements, we can see some improvement in the technology. So uh, to wrap up, uh, I just presented a few interesting methods of data input. And uh, obviously, we know that the current manual design is more reliable. But that does not mean that the new innovative methods are completely useless. And uh, since innovation is key to progress, it's interesting to see what alternative solutions engineers can come up with. So that is it. Good. Just in time. <laughs>